Thank you, Rui. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Um, I just um, unfortunately just saw one uh, presentation and a half, but I was actually blown away by I, I think that's a, a very interesting model where um, you are looking forward to listening to more about the case studies and a little bit of what we are doing. So I will definitely try to uh, focus uh, that on my presentation. So uh, as we said, my name is Daniel, I'm the CEO of Attentive. Um, we uh, are helping uh, companies automate a lot of the sales process altogether. Uh, and that includes qualifying the leads, um, getting to know the leads that are uh, getting colder, uh, how do you re-engage them. So there's a lot of uh, information on getting um, teams that never had a sales process <coughs> and using Attentive uh, with uh, HubSpot uh, behind it. We will just integrate with HubSpot and, and we can automate um, all the activities. So essentially, you will, you, you will have a sales assistant working for you for each of your sales reps and can give you information about the leads. So throughout this process, um, we've learned a lot about uh, you know, how big companies uh, build their sales process and how small companies, when they are starting, they, they also do that. Um, in my previous role at Google, I was working the sales team as well. Um, the sales uh, team at Google was incredibly uh, complex and very, very structured. Um, uh, for example, my role was not a direct sales, so we had indirect sales and direct sales. In my case, I was um, uh, in a kind of a consulting role for digital trends, video, mobile, all those different things. Um, because Google is, uh, was, um, I was only dealing with the biggest customers, so um, it was, uh, it, I was working with a point where I didn't even focus on revenue per se, because we had other people focusing on that. My, um, my, my objective was just to try to bring customers more online, so less TV and more online. So we can get to that level of complexity. Hopefully all of you will get to that point some, someday. We're definitely not there yet. Um, and I really want to tell you more about our process as well um, on, on Attentive, what we've learned from our customers and the companies uh, that are our partners. Um, also at Techstars last year, we saw dozens, probably hundreds of other examples of best practices, uh, what are people doing that is working. So hopefully I'll be able to share some of them. Um, I'm sure that my presentation is not as good as your questions, so feel free to interrupt me at absolutely any time. More than happy to uh, dig a bit deeper in some of our processes as opposed to go through the presentation. Uh, that way I'm sure that you can get uh, more value out of that. So, uh, super quick, what we're going to focus here is, first of all, lead qualification um, is within sales. And from my experience, sales, every term has a different interpretation based on the company, based on the blog, based on the book. Um, just if you think about the word lead, is all, there's many uh, different interpretations of what lead means. Um, in, um, for HubSpot, for example, a lead is an opportunity in, in Salesforce. There's many other uh, interpretations. So bear, bear that in mind as we think about this. So I'm, I want to put, put this here so we start with the same definition that we all agree and we will build on top of that. Uh, why this is really important for you, <laughs> best practices that we've seen. Uh, the minimum viable data, this is where a lot of the work for that, that Attentive is doing really, really covers. Uh, the information that uh, you can find uh, from, from some of the customers, some of our strategies on finding that information for qualifying the lead. How we structure our team for lead qualification. Um, we are a super small team, we're five people, including developers, so it's, it's, we have two people really full-time doing marketing and sales. Uh, so we're very lean, um, instead of saying that we're small, we're lean. So we're, we're going to cover a little bit on how we can do that. Um, and uh, what's next? What I'm seeing um, that uh, is the next step for, for this lead qualification, sales process, yeah, actually sales even in general. I would love to touch on that as well. And um, last um, is just a quick how to um, get, get started guide for smaller companies on how you can really um, jumpstart that. And I, I think even if you have a structured sales process, hopefully I'll have some questions there that, that you can think and um, if you're starting one from scratch, that's one thing. If you're fine-tuning, hopefully I can give you some tips as well on, on the fine-tuning. All right, so let's get started. Lead qualification. What we want to do is just infer the quality. Again, this, um, can, we can think about this in many different ways, but if you want to infer the quality of a potential deal or a potential opportunity, we would we need to define what infer means, what quality means, <coughs> and what is actually a potential and what's a deal for you, right? So this changes by company by company. As we've seen in, in, in the, the previous presentation uh, from Duarte and Jose, um, the way that you think about and you, the, the information you can collect before 
um, you start talking uh, or you do the demo and you, you start making the, the bet analysis on that potential um, deal, that means that you need a lot of information just to start qualifying. Um, so we'll look into uh, a few strategies on how to do this. And the reason we should really focus on qualifying is that um, sales is always a scalable, it's something, it's, it's a process that you need to scale at some point. If you are not scaling, you're selling probably services and not a product. If you're selling product, you need to get to scale uh, sometime. So what I mean by this is you need to get to a point where you're, uh, you're adding a, a very large amount of deals into your, or potential uh, opportunities into your pipeline. You're going through them as quickly as possible. You're excluding the ones that you lost and you're getting money out of the ones that you want, right? So ideally what you want is, what if instead of 100 deals coming in, what if I could find a way to add 1,000, which means at the end of the, the process, I'll just have more dollars at the end, right? So scalability, I think it's not a, a nice to have for sales. It is a must have as you grow. So that's why if you are not focusing on qualifying, even if it's just a mindset in the beginning and you have a few hints on your process on how to do this qualification, this is something that's going to hinder in the future very, very quickly, and you're, you're going to end up with interns when, when, when you're just presenting to those, and you're spending the super valuable time of your sales reps or your team, so many times the founders, doing demos or um, trying to uh, negotiate deals where they are not the priority. So that's why this is really, really key. Just think about the funnel, right? All of you have a CRM, and you know the, uh, the stages of a CRM. If you are only excluding deals, in the, in the, the second to final stage, all of this is time lost that your team has already um, invested in that lead for um, ne next to nothing. You could say, yeah, we learned a little bit more about them, so maybe on the, on the, on the client uh, record, we do have more information, but truth is, that's not as valuable as going through winnable deals. Winnable deals is, for, is surely gonna bring you more dollars much quicker in a direct way. That's why qual qualification is um, really key in the beginning as you think about that. So now if we talk about the lead um, specifically, um, and I, I, there, there was a question in the, in, the, um, in the end of the final presentation where uh, people were asking, well, how do I um, can get rid of uh, pitching to interns or can, if I'm too specific and I request so many things for each of my leads that I only get one lead, right? So you need to find your balance and you're probably never here or here but finding the right balance to be here in the, uh, right in the middle is pretty hard. It's really hard and it's a moving target. Your product hopefully evolves over time, right? You go to different markets. You um, need to think about you know, um, an upselling opportunity. You're selling to smaller companies, but, but we, um, for example, this is happening to us at Attentive, where um, in the beginning we were uh, working more with teams that didn't have a sales process and they would say, look, we need help. Um, we are not hiring sales teams because we don't know um, which process they, they, they should follow. We are, we're not experienced in enforcing a specific sales process. And they would talk to us and say, just install Attentive and you will get a, a, a checklist, a daily checklist. If you clean that checklist, your sales process is implemented. You have all the data and you have all of that information that you need for each of the reps. So that was the initial, uh, the, the starting point. Now we're getting more interest from big, big customers that have um, thousands of sales reps and um, they also have the issue with we don't have enough information on our sales um, CRM and we need help with some software that can make sure that um, the, the sales reps spend less time filling forms on the CRM and they spend more time with customers. Um, stats here super quick, um, they would spend about um, two thirds of their time doing admin work, right? Sales reps in general, they will spend two thirds of their time um, doing admin work. That means, you know, building decks, uh, filling forms in CRMs, booking meetings, all of that. So, in my view, and of course, I'm totally biased and unashamedly, but um, the advance that we saw in the last 10, maybe 15 years now in marketing, um, there was a lot of efficiency, and I saw that we touched a little bit on the efficiencies that we got in marketing in the last few years. Sales is still far behind, in my view, right? People are still doing a lot of these uh, workflows, these processes manually. They, they're using like five or six different services trying to get to that scale. So uh, big companies still have uh, this, this need. So the target for us of what we consider to be a lead is also moving, right? So um, I want to show you a couple of different things that we've thought about uh, in the process for Attentive on trying to, to define what a lead is. 
So there are dozens of different factors that you can think about. In the beginning, uh, the type of company that we were thinking, uh, so the R persona, that would be our, our, our ideal lead. Um, it would be a company that does like two, three million ARR. Um, they would have maybe two sales reps and one of the founders still selling as well. This is super, super common. Um, and also they would be B2B for sure. And ideally in the US market, right? They would be users of Salesforce or HubSpot. Um, so that starts to paint a picture of what, which kind of companies um, do, do we actually target when we use an attentive. You uh, notice that I didn't uh, talk about sector, for example. Sector for us, we realized that was, as we were talking to customers, that sector was not actually that relevant. What we saw that it was relevant is the average ticket that our customers sell to. So if our customers sell products that are deers, using the previous example, um, if they are selling to deers, that's great. Attentive can help because uh, we do a much better um, process. If the process is complex, <coughs> it's, it's long, has many touch points, that's where attentive can really help. If you have, a, if you're only selling to flies, then attentive is not as helpful because um, your sales cycle is super short. So um, you just want to automate as much as you can. You won't have many of those touch points. So that was the initial um, thing that we were thinking about. Time of deployment is now super super key as we move into enterprise. Time of deployment is uh, the, the time that we take from the. Uh, from, from closing a contract until they are fully fledged, fully adopted in terms of the, um, the number of users that, that we agreed on the contract. Initially, that was not a problem at all because we were talking to mid-sized companies, right? They were selling two to three million. They were super fast. They didn't have a lot of integrations. They didn't have a lot of security standards initially. So they had to rely on HubSpot and Salesforce's uh, security standards um, and they didn't have their own processes. Time of deployment, security has, plays a big role, so that changes a lot. The way that we consider what is a lead based on this. Now think about your own companies. Your own companies will have a very different uh, <coughs> set of leads. Maybe sector is key for you. Um, I'm sure for Infraspeak, sector is key because you're not, you won't be selling that to uh, other software companies. So maybe for now, uh, eventually, who knows. But um, I'm sure that you guys have specific sectors that you're targeting in the beginning, in markets. Um, for us, we will, we will have different variables. So it's key that, that they have a specific list. Another thing that we've noticed as we've spoken with dozens of sales teams is um, when uh, people see this, they're like, yeah, of course, of course we know. We know, like, we don't need to see this. Um, then do this test. Ask your, each of your sales reps, if you have more than one, and ask them, what do they think if this is? And I'm pretty sure the list is gonna be different. Right? Because they have different hints from the market. Which is great, by the way. That's very valuable knowledge that they acquire over time when they're speaking to customers. Um, it, for me, it was super fun in the beginning when we were interviewing a lot of sales reps. And we will ask them, so what's the pattern that you see? And each sales rep, they have that, like their, their hidden formula. They were like, oh, I know. When I see like a healthcare customer, they've been on my website, and they, they send an email that has two paragraphs, that's a click for me. You know, they, they start to see these patterns. That's again the scalability that each of the sales reps gets. They, they start to get this feeling of, I, I now can sense what is a qualified lead for me, right? Um, so this is really uh, interesting. I don't think that, you know, that, it, that there's a streamlined uh, way of, of looking at this, but um, having a few guidelines that each company have, and then of course over time, the sales reps will have a, uh, a slightly tweaked version of this, of this list that, um, that applies for their market, right? Because if they go to different regions, they're gonna sell in a different way. So what is a qualified lead um, for a specific market can be different. This is super common. Um, again, our example, we, the, the, the biggest chunk of our customers come from the US. So we expect a, a very good knowledge of what a sales process is, of uh, the, the comparison between a uh, Salesforce and a Pipedrive and a ProsperWorks and uh, you know, all the other CRMs, they, um, from our experience, the majority, they will know exactly what are the difference between the CRMs, how to implement. Also, the people that are working with these uh, softwares in the US, they have 15 years of experience in um, digital sales, so they know this very well. We have um, other smaller countries uh, that we just have like one or two customers for now, that there's, a request for a lot more education uh, that they require from us. 
So that's it's it's much harder um, in those cases to um, to uh, to readjust the sales process. But again, the qualification is going to be very different because if I have to spend a lot of time with my U.S. customers as well in doing that, um, then it gets uh, very cumbersome on the process. And um, so as you think about this, this will help you have a list of what is this qualified lead, what are the variables, and you, you can have, again, 20. Um, they, you, there's no silver bullet that uh, can define um, this for, for each of your companies, so you really have to think about this um, as a team. Um, and, uh, and yeah, as you think about different markets, you will see that that eventually will become more complex. Throughout this presentation, you will see that um, I'm always thinking about this as a spectrum in terms of uh, the complexity of the sales uh, process. If you are starting out right now, um, and you think, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're too small, we don't need a process at all. Well, I'm sure you have a process, even if it's not uh, explicit, you have some process, something, which is people send me an email and I reply. That's the, the, probably the most basic process, but as you add complexity, you can get to the, the one that uh, we showed uh, for InfraSpeak and others that can be even more complex. But always try to see that your spectrum, you're always trying to go from the simple process, which the, it's nothing wrong with that, and you're adding complexity over time. Instead of, you know, you see one that is ultra complex, super detailed, super thorough, and if you, start, if you want to do that in the beginning, it's not going to work. It's just not going to work. You need to add, you need to learn so much from your customers. How are you going to sell to them? What are the variables that are important? What do they value on your product? Do we need um, one marketing person, one sales, one customer success? Or do we need three salespeople in different markets to be actually to do that because we don't need as much customer success? That is always specific to your product. If you're trying to add more sales reps, the industry metric or reference is <coughs> that for, um, for each sales rep that you want to add, you need to have 5x on the revenue that they are bringing in. Just as a reference, it could be three, it could be seven, again, it depends on, on your market, but if you think about it, um, how much does a, a sales rep cost in Portugal versus in the US, which is very different, um, you need to say, okay, if that person costs me 100K, they need to bring 500K in, in, in terms of revenue. Now, if I'm spending um, the, the 100k, uh, uh, or sorry, the 500k revenue from from that um, sales rep, and they are spending all the time trying to qualify lead or going or doing demos to uh, leads that are not qualifying. They're not going to get to that number, and the unit economics for your business are not going to work, right? So the numbers change, but this ratio of the the, the one to five um, is is really good for you as well as as you think about um, hiring more sales reps. Um, it's, it's easy as well if you have the, the, the information, you know your average sales cycle, you know the ACVs of your business, um, and you know exactly that. Is it feasible for someone to bring in five times what revenue um, the, the, their cost? Or even if it's a bit less, that's fine. And you will expect, of course, over time that they will increase that as they have more networks and all of that. Um, one thing that uh, I just want to also say, I probably I'm going to use, and I'm sure you're, you're used to a lot of acronyms. If I use one that is not clear, just let me know. I'll clarify that. I'll make sure that I know what I'm talking about. Um, so with this, so this is one variable, right? So you think about uh, these sections. And right now, you can think about the others. You can think about your business. This is the ACV thing that, um, uh, that um, was shared in the previous presentation as well from, uh, from Duarte and Jose. This will actually have also an impact on your qualification. So um, it, well, I, I was actually very happy that they brought that. So you can see this, um, this variable as well in the marketing, but also in sales. This is gonna affect a lot about um, uh, on this. So I won't spend more time. I think they covered much better than I could. Uh, so that's great. In terms of the, um, the process of qualification, they talked about BENT. BENT is, uh, it was invented by IBM, I think in the 70s. So it's pretty old, and that's a good sign here because I think it's robust. It's generic um, because it only covers these four things, but it's by no means the only um, the only um, uh, methodology for, for qualification. I think it's the most used. It's the, definitely the one that I see the most. Uh, there are others. Uh, this is a beautiful acronym. It's totally going to stay in that spot. Everyone's going to remember this. Um, there's CHAMP. There's one called MEDIC. There's one called SPIN. There's um, probably every company will have a different version uh, of a methodology. Um, I don't want to tell you that you should use BENT or 
Mamaba or Champ or Medic or any of the others. Because th this comes down to the variables that you already thought about, that I told you about in the beginning, right? It depends what is important for you here. I like Ben because it's generic enough that you can um, adjust uh, for your company. Um, but of course, it's, if instead of Ben you have all of this, great. Um, but I think in the beginning it's super hard to have all of this. And even just in Bend, um, covering all these four uh, bases is pretty hard uh, by itself. Again, coming back to Attentive, how do we use this in our case, just to give you um, the way that we use. Um, so, loosely speaking, um, we have one person doing the marketing side, so that person is, um, is responsible for uh, booking uh, demos in my calendar, and I do the from demo to close. Roughly, there are exceptions, but that's really, um, since we're only two, we're hiring now, but um, for those two, that's the way that we are doing. So if I get a demo in my calendar, and I don't have partially this information, that's, the, the chances of that demo going well are, are very low, because I don't have enough information to see how Attentive can adapt. So we use HubSpot for all of this. Uh, Francisco, he would qualify the lead first, and uh, even if the lead comes from the website, I think right now more than 85% of our leads are still organic SEO type of leads that come to our website. Um, and uh, you will have the first step of qualifying. Uh, people can, on our website, uh, sign in uh, by themselves for now. We are, um, I think that's probably a common thing. Over time, as you get more and more requests, you will turn off that feature. That's, uh, that, that's our, our thinking there. So if you go to our website, you can uh, um, connect to your HubSpot right now and uh, use Attentive, and then we will talk to you afterwards, after you sign in uh, with, uh, with Attentive. So that's the process. Over time, that is, that, that's not scalable. And I think that's the point of probably inf infra speak is now, which is you don't want to do that. You want to make sure people are using it correctly, they have the budget, and they cover all bases. So we do it a different way, right? So they will install Attentive, and then we'll talk to them and see if they have this. For now, the conversion is good enough that we say, for now it works. I think it's going to get um, much worse as we start any outbound activities, right? If, you, if we just do like a big paid advertising campaign, this is going to go bad very, 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 very quick. Because people can install, they are the wrong person, they, are, uh, they don't have the authority to do that. Um, but the, the, we, we cover um, some of these areas almost by, by default. For example, the authority, if you have, you're authorized to connect your CRM, you are probably, uh, we, we are talking to the, the right person. So, you remember I was talking about the two markets that Attentive is covering now, like the mid-market mid and then the enterprise. With mid-market, usually that's the CEO or the head of sales who's going to connect uh, the, the CRM. So that's one thing. When it's enterprise, there are so many loops that we, uh, and so many hoops that we need to, to, to jump before we can get to, to them installing Attentive, that when they do, that's already a good sign. We got the authority um, to cover that. Budget, um, in terms, uh, for us, the way that we think about budget is um, we are, um, since they, they already um, installed Attentive, usually, again, um, we don't mind uh, talk, talking about budget. Um, we can get to, to an, an ROI conversation super quick because um, one measure of success for us is the improvement that we can do on the sales velocity of a, of a company. So when they install Attentive and they clean up the initial actions, we can already show the before and after. Um, and um, so even if they don't have the, the initial budget, which is uh, fairly cheap, and because we charge by seats, it's, it gets hurt super quickly on the, on the conversation. My experience tells me that the budget conversation sometimes is not about accounting, it's more about um, anchoring, right? So what I mean by this is um, they will tell you they don't have budget. What budget, right? If the company, well, if they literally do not have money in the bank, they, are, they don't have a budget, fine, but the majority, definitely the majority do. The issue is, can you convince them that you're so valuable that you have to um, grow besides the, the, the budget that they have for sales, right? If we can tell them, well, we can double your sales team's productivity because we can go through twice the number of deals that they're going right now. Like, okay, well, if they can go um, through the twice the number of deals because they don't have to spend time on this inefficient process, okay, maybe that uh, the budget pays for itself, right? If we can show that we closed 
two additional customers or five additional customers uh, because Attentive allowed them to go through that uh, faster cycle, the budget suddenly appears. So um, this is the, 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 the angle that we take for smaller businesses. For enterprise, of course they have money. So when they talk about budget, it, that's always a negotiation um, thing. Um, at Google, when we were negotiating um, other tools that we wanted to use internally, we, we, we did have a, a fixed budget, but the fixed budget um, was uh, fixed for only one year, and it was totally based on our ability to get more budget, right? So it's up to us to make the internal case to, uh, to, to get additional budget. So we can totally, this, it is manageable. In the beginning, again, if you are hunting flies, you won't have the resources to actually fight uh, all of, the, of these fights. So um, you probably, if you're hunting flies, you don't even care about budget. It's automated, do they pay? Yes, they have budget. If they don't pay, they don't have budget, right? What else do we have here? So for need, um, we now are starting to see what are the patterns when people are, are using uh, attentive. What is the specific need? Um, the most common one for us is uh, the one I told you uh, before, which is they are not hiring salespeople because they, they have a process that they know is super leaky and they don't have that initial information. If we hear that, that's a good sign that they're probably, they check this one, right? Timing, that's hard. It, timing is hard, I think, for um, uh, enterprise software in general because timing has many variables that you, could, you do not control. For example, they are, um, which I think, in my view, is probably worse than budget in this sense because if they have the priorities for this quarter, they have a budget for this quarter, that is much, from my experience again, it's much harder to fight that than fight money. An enterprise customer, if you can charge them more money, because you know, if, if you get into the door, you can get um, to, uh, to show people the demo and all that, you already have a, a step there, and they already confirm that they have the money for that. And they, have, they are very um, uh, insensitive to price in that respect. What they care about is, is my team going to actually use it? Do I have the resources to implement this um, this quarter? My uh, security team is uh, completely stacked this month, so we there's no chance we're going to review this this month. So this one is, I think, can be hard. Um, but again, if they have a super urgent need, it's easy to sense that they need to implement this straight away. And there, there are other strategies that, that, that you can uh, use to try to uh, assess how urgent this is, you know, how quickly they respond to your emails, you know, how long the emails are, do they involve other people from the, the company super fast, or do they, you know, they want to keep the conversation for themselves, that's not usually a good sign. So, as you involve, you will see if the, the timing is right. So, um, first, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, for example, you were saying that uh, for you to have a call, a normal call with someone, you actually need to have advanced already and sort of defined. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so imagine, are you to even consider doing a call, the first thing to install it, to install attentive so that then you can qualify and decide whether it makes sense to do them. How, how is that process for you? Sure. And how maybe you get into the data points? Sure. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, um, for now, we don't requ I, I don't ask uh, Francisco to give me super detail on, 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 on the four. If he gives me a hint on two, that's enough. So um, I think that's that's very important because you're, you're always talking you're always talking about um, uh, some lack of information. You don't have all the information, right? So if he says we spoke briefly and he they definitely have the budget and the, they are like they are talking to us every day. They definitely have the need. That's probably enough, you know, for us to get to the demo stage. If you use this strategy and you don't do demos and you you want to move to contract faster, then you probably need all of them. So it it, it varies. Uh, from um, uh, from from case to case. In our case, maybe two. I think it's a it's a it's a good sign uh, that that we have it. The way we do it is um, on our sales pipeline. The first one, the first column, it's all Francisco's, and when he moves to the second column, which is uh, a demo booked, um, he he'll he'll add a note with these things, and I can move them back, which sometimes I do. Um, if if we have too many. Then it's up to me. Remember, like on the on the initial slide here, if 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 I say no, 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 what what out? Because of course, marketing will, will want to go here, and sales will want to go here, mm -hmm. right? What's the, the if you ask any sales rep, what they will say is our leads are weak. We don't the leads. There's no information. 
marketing uh, sucks, they're always sending us bad leads because they want this, right? And then marketing is uh, if usually they're paid on leads, so they say, well, of course, they want to broaden as much as possible. So you need to find this balance mm -hmm. uh, right here. They are implementing more or less the same process? Yeah. And also having someone qualifying the lead and to be interesting. Because just to understand yeah. like, what kind of work you're actually doing with the process. So yes. Yeah. yeah. So one, um, if, he, if we have website, uh, we see that, that we know that they're already using uh, HubSpot or Salesforce when they connect. And with this information, that's enough, I think, to do a good demo. <coughs> and what I mean by a good demo is if but they already created the account. Do the Sorry? Do, do you go off to the clients and say, you should do a demo, or they, they actually come to you? No, no, it's they, they already book on the calendar. Oh, okay. uh, it, it is already booked. So I don't even need, need so to do that. So they just qualify before it's yes. them. Yeah. yeah, so I will, the, the, what I will prepare for the demo is that I will use their account, uh, which makes things easier, because I, make, I, I can make already recommendations saying, for example, when you connect attentive, we can detect deals that don't have any owner, uh, deals that have been um, in your pipeline for over 90 days. We can detect that um, the deals have been created after they were won, which a lot of sales reps do. They just go to the CRM when they won deals. They don't go when they, when they lost deals. So they just register after they won. Um, so we can detect all those uh, data inaccuracies, and that's part of the report that, we, that I can show them right on the demo. If I don't have this, then it's, it's definitely harder because I will have to make a generic pitch and uh, we don't, I, I don't know which angle is interesting for them. If, if I'm speaking with a head of sales, <laughs> what I want them to see is I will make sure that you don't have to nag your team all like every week to make sure they put the numbers on the CRM and you have numbers, you have a pipeline data that you can trust. That's my pitch to the head of sales. If I'm speaking with a sales rep, he doesn't care about that at all. What I'm gonna tell him is look, I know you spend too much time on your CRM I'm going to cut that in, into just one minute a day. And, and how, do, how do you bring, like, a, so I, I imagine that you don't want to, to make a call someone that is not a decision maker. Yes. So how do you bring them to the table if they're not? Um, for now, if, they are, if, if, if we see that they are, um, um, that's, that's very um, situation specific. If we see that there's a potential that that person can get us to the right person, <coughs> maybe we'll do it. Um, if not, we, ju we just don't, don't take it. Um, the, the tricky thing there, which I think is, is worth thinking about, is it depends on your resources. If we, for the, the last two weeks, we don't have enough um, leads anyway, might as well. But, uh, so you wanna make sure that your, your, your team is always overflowing with enough deals. Which, you know, if you think about it, it's very easy to get a list of <coughs> 10,000 companies. The issue is, what, what uh, 100 out of those 10,000 could be my customers, right? That, that's, that's qualification. So the issue is never, can I overflow my team? Because you always can. The issue is, um, can, can, I, can, they, can, can we spend that time being the most productive? So sometimes you need to go broad, um, as long as you do it in a conscious way. And uh, you know, we went broad because um, that made sense because of this, this, and that. But we, we need to go back to being specific to make sure that, that our conversion doesn't suffer, because it will suffer, right? Yeah, or at least if you take into account you know, many sales reps, many regions, as you add up, you, it will become very, very clear the conversion will be uh, uh, different. Okay, thanks. Sure. All good? Any other questions? No? Okay. So we saw this. Um, so my, my message here is there's so many different uh, methodologies. Uh, it's worth re it's worth thinking about them because there could be some here um, that, that could be different for you. Um, so just have a read these three. Uh, if you don't want to spend time uh, looking at this, just 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 go with this. And you know, just a simple sentence for each one of them as you're qualifying makes such a big difference. And um, another thing that I see all the time in in the sales process is there's a lot of uh, implied knowledge that you, you know that people know, right? You know that the, um, everyone knows that that lead is hot and, and everyone knows that we know the CEO of that company, um, but it's, you'd be surprised by the amount of information that if the whole team knew that you knew the CEO of that company, that you knew that um, uh, they have a, uh, they, they, you just overheard that they have a specific need and they're losing money because of this, that makes such a big difference, not only 
because you will increase considerably the, the, the potential of closing the deal. Um, but also, you will, be in a, in a, you will be in a much better position to learn from all of those right, records, right? Because you can look back and you qualify them super well and you lost a deal and you start seeing, huh, interesting. We always think that their budget is big enough, but they always complain about budget, you know, further down the road, a month after that. So if you don't have that registered, then there's no way you can see that those patterns. And again, sales is about getting to scale eventually, right? So you will need to be able to do that pattern matching. That's what's going to really bring the efficiency into a process is are you able to see those patterns and can we act on them, right? So just putting one line there, that's going to bring you uh, that knowledge of which of the um, leads are, are, are well qualified or are wrong qualified. Okay. Um, so why, why do you lose deals? Um, this was a, um, a report that, done from Coral's AI, definitely highly recommend it. Um, but I, I just wanted to highlight this, which is they, um, Coral's AI, by the way, they, they do um, call analysis for sales. So they will just listen into your call and uh, they will try to see why you lost that deal or why you won that deal. And it's interesting because if you see it pretty much covers band, that's probably the, the, the most common reason that you have Budget, timing, you know, the authority, pretty much it covers all the areas. Um, what I like about this is that um, budget here is uh, the majority of all of this, which you would think, but again, um, I would challenge you to think about budget in a way that it is a perceived value thing. It's not an accounting thing. Um, that's why, you know, the, the easiest answer for, for, uh, for, a, for a prospect to get rid of you is saying, oh, we just don't have the money. It's always a value perception thing. It's not actually a uh, money thing many, many times. Uh, there are many, many stats uh, around this uh, area around um, sales efficiency um, and um, really trying to understand how can you qualify um, your, your deals. Okay, so moving on to minimal viable data. So I, I, uh, what I want to highlight here is the information that, you know, um, if you think about the, if we go back again to the framework of flies and elephants, right? We started probably here, and now we're moving to here. Like, we, we are probably in these two <laughs> stages. In the beginning, or if you're hunting flies, probably name, email, amount, maybe um, phone number in some cases. It could also be here. Um, and that's fine. If you just say, this is more of a, a strategic decision that you take, and I, I urge you to just pick one or a variation, uh, your variation of this, and you say, for us, this is a qualified deal. This plus, you know, it could be that we want to have a, have a full band analysis on our uh, records so, so that we can make that analysis. Again, it is a strategic decision because you cannot do this if you're selling $10 a month. So that's why we started um, our, I tried to start with, with the strategic point of view of <coughs> what are the variables for, for our leads and what are the, um, the, the ACVs for them, that, that's gonna tell me what are the sales economics that make sense when I'm trying to sell, right? Uh, if we are, um, if you're selling to, to um, an ACV that is so big that, that we can allow to have 10 meetings and go to lunch and, and all of that, you should definitely have, they should see you as a, a measure of progress and an email is not enough. You need to show them that you went from, uh, actually, if I, um, I think my role at Google was definitely here. I was not trying to sell, what I was trying to say is trying to change um, or shift their view on online. That's, it was totally proactive, um, no pitch at all, so we're, we're there. I think um, this one is very interesting, that that's where we think the majority of sales is moving over time, which is you not only have the information which you can automate, um, for example, just give a, a work email and use tools like Full Contact, for example. <coughs> there are dozens of others. Uh, we use Full Contact and it can give you so much information about that person, company, where they work, um, you know, the size of the company, revenue, <coughs> all of that. And many tools uh, are free or they have like free tiers, so it's not even a question of budget. I think Full Contact had a free API that you can use and can connect and, and do lead enrichment just using this information. So it's really up to you how much information you need, you need there and what is for you like a perfect lead. So think about that. When you look at your CRM and you see a, a, a deal in the third stage, what information would you want to see there, right? 
um, you should move from the first stage of not a lot of information, the minimum could be one of these, you pick again, and as you move to close deal, then you move to having, you know, going up the ladder and really getting a lot of information um, into the process. So, yeah, so the, the, these are, the, this part is totally auto automatable, I think, until here. This is becomes more, more much, much more strategic as you, you do this. Um, this can be super helpful as, as you do comparisons in the industry. You know, can you, is the industry overall growing? Um, is this a good time for them to invest? Um, and uh, we, we were actually uh, talking, um, uh, Sal, Salvador and I, were, we were talking before the, uh, uh, at lunch time, and he was telling me how he found out the, the perfect time for, for his industry to go and chat with them. That's an industry learning, right, that, that he can use when saying, you know, in this quarter, that's the right time to, to go talk to them because they have this, this, and that. So you'll move on up, up a ladder on getting this information. So um, in terms of the team structure, um, I'm sure many of you have read the book uh, Predictable Revenue from, from Aaron Ross. Um, we try to use a, a simplified version of that. This is our, the way that we think about our structure internally. But um, as if you remember, we don't have four people. Uh, but that's fine. The way that we will do it, we'll, we will just have blocks on our calendar saying, I am doing inside sales uh, work this morning or this afternoon. Usually it's, it's this afternoon because of the US. And, um, and, uh, and then sometimes I will just do account executive uh, time. Why um, is uh, specialization such a big issue or so important? Because you can compare um, your, your efficiency um, if, if you do sprints or if you just compare week by week, every Thursday, how many calls did, did I go through, uh, did I close them or not, so it's much easier um, because if you are doing a little bit of everything all the time, it's just going to be very noisy. You won't be able to understand which strategies are working. Again, it, come back, it, it comes back to getting to scale. If you scale, you have to repeat the exact same thing many times and see which parts are common on the success factors. And then um, if you do the specialization, this is how you do it. So. Uh, the SDR will do the qualification and book meetings. Um, it's super, de it totally depends again on the company. If you want to do outbound, pure outbound, with trying to book the demos without any qualification, or you, in our case, we want a person. Uh, since we get the, the great, great majority of our leads come inbound, um, and we prefer to rely on those, so the only thing we need to do is qualify them properly. Remember, they already opened the account, uh, and then book the meeting. And I usually do the demo, and I readjust the qualification uh, based on um, the if I if if, it, if I get a lost lead here, or if I move them forward, <coughs> right? Of course, you can still lose them here. That's totally fine. Um, and the reason why we lost them, it could be that um, our product, uh, the the value proposition was not right, something like that. But there's in every lost opportunity, there's a learning for for the qualification of you know perceived value was not there. Uh, we're selling to, you know, we're, they, we wrote an article that totally focused on our junior people and we got leads out of that, it could be. Uh, it really helps to have this um, um, uh, saw this way. The one that is not very well done uh, in um, our team right now is some success as we were doing more ad hoc. We have some reporting that, that we will do, we'll contact them. Uh, we'll, adoption for us is the most important thing is um, since Attentive will send uh, via Slack or email a couple of actions for each of the sales reps. Uh, what we track is, are the sales reps doing the actions on Attentive or not? Uh, are, they, are they going through those? Um, are, are, were they able to clean them? So it's easy for us to have a measure of adoption. Um, and uh, we just look uh, reactively if the adoption is not there or is, is, is slipping. That's where we will come in and, um, and, and focus on the adoption side. Um, upsell, eventually, but that's not um, a focus for now. Yes? On adoption, do you have any particular, like, I mean, it's a for the level or something like that? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, what the, the, the baseline is um, they need to, um, since we are, we are sending actions every day, they need to complete at least one per, per rep. Now, it has some, uh, some nuances. For example, um, if they didn't create any actions, you could have one day where there's actually no action. Um, so we need to be careful that it's open actions that they are not uh, clearing. Um, there's also many deals that don't have an owner. Uh, so that is definitely not enough. It, what we see is more, it's more of a, a trigger for us to have a look at that accounting in more detail. 
as we don't have the resources to, to look at all the accounts that are inattentive. And when we see those, then we'll look into that. Um, on the product side though, um, when I put my product manager's hat, uh, I will go through all the accounts uh, with reporting and then we'll, I'll do deep dive on all accounts. For example, who are the ones that have the biggest percentage of deals without amounts, which is a sign for us that the information is not good on the CRM. The ones that have a big amount of deals that are stale, so more than 90 days old, or they don't have amounts of the deals, those are signs that there's, there might be an issue with that account. Right? So the way we thought about this is, Let's make sure that we have a trigger that is simple, straightforward, and it's always on. And then we do a weekly review where we will try to go a bit deeper onto the accounts and see how things are going. Right, so um, what's next? Many of you, how, how many of you do this type of lead scoring? Like going into having specific um, scores for each one of them? No? Um, right now, this is what a lot of Companies are just selling this specific uh, feature. Um, eventually, if you get to that complexity of getting into, into that, that's great. I find it very um, uh, brittle, right? If you, if, you, if you see what I mean. It's very hard to, to have this, this number and not be uh, super um, random, if I might say. Um, but it could be a good reference if you get, and I think that's the key thing, you need to get hundreds of leads. For, each, for, 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 for this to work. If not, you don't have enough volume to be able to do that. Uh, if, if, if you do that, it's great, right? If you don't have to have a person look, looking at the account and doing this analysis, if you can get a, a system, an automated system that does this scoring for you, awesome. But it's, it's, it's just not easy to do. There are many, many um, companies right now focusing on trying to do this automatically with AI lead scoring. Um, but I think there is always an issue, and this is my just word of caution for you. When you see demos, you get absolutely in love with this because it's so beautiful. You know, when you get a lead and it gives a score, and you say you need to talk to them straight away, and they are from the, this industry, and you have this third level connection with that person. Truth is, it's beautiful when it works, but it never works, uh, right? It's super hard to get the level of data that you can use to train and then use in a real context. It's the same with, um, with BI, right? With having dashboards that look beautiful and your pipeline is shiny. Demos are amazing because you, we all uh, love to see charts and, and numbers and growth and all that. But if the underlying data is bad, there's really nothing you can do there. So that's my word of caution with this. If you start with something of, you know, it's your own notes and you use those to qualify, that's a good start. If you can get to that, that's, that's great. Others, um, we have a company that is super friends with ours um, called Matt Kudu. They do like, they do this AI lead scoring, they, but it's a black box as well, which I also, like, it could work if it works great, but the, it is still a black box that you do not control. Um, so bear that in mind. Um, what I'm more interested in is on getting the scoring and the cycling. So for lead cycling, some, some tools that, I haven't seen one that is um, uh, super strict on this, but I think after lead scoring, you get to do the cycling ride, that's, that gets interesting. So for the ones that don't know, lead cycling is when you attribute a lead that just uh, came in to the right sales rep to, to follow on. Right now, some teams just do, you know, you assign based on region or you assign based on you know, when it came in and you just do uh, to the next sales rep available. Um, you do intelligent lead cycling, it can become super interesting. If you see, for example, that based on lead scoring, that a, this lead will need many touch points. And you have one sales rep that is particularly good at having too many touch points, or is really good with this industry, or is really good with the, some particular uh, property, then you can do a super intelligent cycling with getting the leads to the sales rep that has the highest probability of closing that lead and keeps informing the system. Uh, so that's where we will eventually uh, get to. Um, the, but you, before that, you need to have a system where it, and all the touch points are registered somewhere, and you can use them to um, uh, to learn. So you have enough volume as well uh, to to go through that. So I, I think this we are still a bit far away before we can get to this. Uh, first of all, you need to get one CRM, one place that has all your sales data, and then on top of that, that everyone is using that and is registering everything. You have enough uh, lead volume that can give you that. So we're still far away. 
Uh, Salesforce, for example, they are doing this with uh, the famous Einstein thing. Um, uh, Einstein, uh, by show of hands, do, does everyone know what Einstein is? No? Okay, sorry. Um, glad, glad, glad I asked. Um, Einstein is a vision, I'd, I'd call it, from, from Salesforce uh, on how um, AI would be applied to CRMs. It's more of a vision than a product, but they are saying, you know, intelligent CRMs, you know, as they evolve right now, uh, CRM is simply a database, if you think about it, is a, um, a database that requires a lot of human input and a lot of effort from, from, from humans, and they want to make it more intelligent, use artificial intelligence to be able to do that, and they call that initiative Einstein. One of the first, I think the first actually, the, the, the first real product out of that initiative, out of the Einstein initiative, is getting uh, some, it's, it's getting a score based on artificial intelligence. Um, so companies are trying to, to add that here and they will also do some type of lead enrichment uh, based on that lead. Um, <coughs> ideally, uh, but think about it. Think about the, the number of um, uh, things that you need to, to, for, for this to work properly. And the, the comparison is just, just having someone on the team just doing this bad analysis or some, something else just saying, this lead is good because of this, or it's not good because of that. Um, of course, when you, you, if, you get, if you have 500 leads a month, you won't be able, or 500 a week, you won't be able to do that analysis, but that's the, the balance that we are always trying to do between how much uh, time do we have from our team, and how, how much uh, resources can we allocate to doing the qualification right, before we get to uh, <coughs> everything automated. Um, before I go to the, the get started on my, oh, okay, I really need to get that. So forget about that, let's just move super quick. Um, so, I want to make sure that you all have at least some uh, parts that you will rethink or at least discuss with your team. That for me would be a good um, outcome out of, this, um, out, out, out of this session. So, the first thing that you have to do is, uh, when I say define, I'm assuming you have no pipeline, which I'm sure you do. So think about it as rethink as well, uh, if that's your case, rethink your sales pipeline, or questions you might have around your sales pipeline. Only then you can get to the qualification criteria for, 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 your, um, uh, for, for your company. How do you make sure that you can repeat this process in a way that you can learn out of it, right? And then the, there's a lot of positive externalities that when you do this cycle super well, that, that you can get there. So, defining a uh, sales pipeline, these are, Super quick, the things that you need to think about um, or when you're rethinking your sales pipeline. Um, the number of leads that you get through the process, ignore the sales reps right now organically or even if, if, if you're doing outbound, how many leads can you actually realistically put into your system every week, right? If you do that and then you divide by the number of reps that you have or, or, or if you want to do by hour so that you, you will only uh, allocate half of your time, for example, that's going to give you how much time you will have uh, per, uh, per, per lead uh, based on your current efforts. That's going to change your process altogether. Um, that's going to tell you how many touch points you can have with each of your leads. Why is this important? Because after that, you can say, um, if that um, lead is requesting that we have the, the sixth meeting, we're running out of time for, for that lead. It's not, uh, it was not well qualified in the beginning. So it should go back to the initial process. That comes back then to the qualification criteria that it will inform you and will uh, change this. You remember the initial uh, triangle, the, the, the funnel thing with the broad and specific? This is where you will see where you sit, right? On being too broad. Uh, and again, that's a, a lever that you play with all the time, where you can increase when you need to increase and you can decrease when you need to decrease, right? Um, on, the, on the criteria, just thinking about the, method, the methodology, we talked about um, uh, BACT a lot, but there's others again. Um, make, make, make sure that it's one that you will use um, instead of one that is scientifically correct, because none will be scientifically correct, so might as well do something that people will actually use. Even if you create one that just has two variables, that's totally fine, as long as uh, you, you would use it. You could be just review on the website and see if there's a match just looking at the website. You know, you could, you could make it as simple as possible, as long as people will do it constantly with all, or, all the leads that you would have it. Um, think about where the information about that lead will, uh, or about that qualification will sit. If it's on the CRM, great. If you use an Excel file, that's totally fine. If you want to write it on a, on a, on a wall, no problem at all. 
but you have to document it somehow. You need to make sure that it is registered. That's the way, again, that you can compare and look over time how you're doing with leads. And then lastly, who is owning? You remember in our case, we have Francisco. Clearly, he is the owner, I'm not the owner, and he transitions <coughs> when the qualification is done. So he is responsible for the qualification. Um, this is not to say that when things are uh, bad, uh, bad uh, they're wrongly qualified, that he did a bad job, because we are always iterating, right? So the market is shifting, the, the target is always moving, so what I'm, my responsibility is making sure I give them the right information for him to tweak the qualification criteria over time. But if you don't have an owner for that, you just say, we decide this, and you just ignore that, which is probably the most common thing, is just, okay, we'll, we'll decide on these three factors. Nobody owns that, six months later, those three things are completely outdated, and, um, and they're not being uh, very, very useful for your process. That's why you need to have someone that is always thinking about that, and always uh, thinking about how can we uh, shift those things over time. The, the rinse and repeat, the important is, um, you need to find a process. Um, I know some companies will do sprints for sales and marketing. Um, in our case, we review uh, every week all on, on the data, but on, or only every month we will talk about the criteria, right? Um, this is uh, the process where we'll say, are we going to broad uh, this, this last month? How do we do on the conversions? Um, we did um, super well, actually, but we didn't have many. So, okay, let's broaden it a bit. Or we go, uh, we just had too much noise, too many uh, lost time in, uh, in meeting, and you can really try to find that. Lastly, is the process too cumbersome? Remember that the, if you define a beautiful process and you can you know, make it as complex as you can make, but people are, are not using, that's the worst process you will have. So that's why I always start with a super simple process, just one or two things to qualify. We have clear owners and you can get through the process for sure. Then on this monthly, bi-weekly, whatever makes sense for you, as you review, you can add complexity, right? You can say, this is working fine. Cool. Let's um, add you know more qual qualification, or let's add a new stage on our pipeline. Right? There's always things that you can add, but if you start with something complex, you don't know which bits are um, useful and which ones are not. So this is another thing to, to have. So think about it. Don't think about the process as something that, that is stale. It has to be something that will evolve as the market evolves, your product evolves, your team is growing. This the qualification part is something that is always moving. So if you don't have a process to think if things are working at this point, then um, you will be obsolete in a month, super quick. Uh, so um, this is my, um, my, my word of caution here is think about it in a, not in the way that let's find the best process, we'll lock ourselves in, um, in, a, in a room for two days, not uh, access to internet, and we will define the, the ultimate sales process because you won't have it. Remember, lean processes all the way, we will start with something, that works, and we will keep evolving it to make sure that it fits um, our our company, and we always rethinking that and discussing it as a team. And to be honest, it makes all this process much more interesting. It makes the job for sales and marketing much more strategic, as you're thinking about the market and all the components that are part of it. And that's what I really think that the sales um, sector will evolve. Um, I don't think AI is going to replace sales at all. Um, yeah, on, on the contrary, it's going to replace the boring parts of the sales job. It, but it's going to leave much more time to be much more strategic, add much more value to your customers, and that's what I think is really interesting. And I think technology will enable that. Um, if we if we think about these um, the the boring bits that, that we can automate and get rid of those, we can just focus on adding value to the customers. Um, so oh, I think that's the next slide, no? Yes. Ah, oh, right. Okay. So this is um, uh, sorry. The, the this is the last one. The positive ex externalities. Just to close it off, the first thing, if you have this process, um, you actually will be able to inform marketing right in the beginning of the leads that don't convert, right? If you don't have a, a, a documented process, it's just going to be your opinion on things. If you document it, it's very clear the leads that didn't work and why they, they, they didn't work. Your sales quota is going to be much easier as well to project because you know how many leads you can get into the process, you know your conversions, you know how much time you take to convert, so you can project your sales quotas, your investors will love you for that. Um, and you know as well, over time you can do testings with messaging and you know, um, let's try to uh, solve a specific need. Um, let's uh, pitch only to head of sales in our case, right? Let's ignore the sales reps, let's just pitch that and see if, that, um, if the budget comes up less often. That tells us, oh, we found a way to, 
to unlock additional budget based on messaging. If you document it, then you can use it to really understand how the messaging works. And from my experience, and I spoke with people with like 20 years of sales experience, with uh, sold six companies, two IPOs, and they always um, are the most humble of all. It's always the people that have the most experience when they say, nobody knows what works. Absolutely nobody knows. You have to give it a go, and you never know which messaging works for your company. It's a question of you know iterating and keep working on that. Thank you very much.